Alrighty, so is it just me or is anyone else walking around with trust issues? Anybody else get nervous when that 5G symbol pops up on your cell phone? Is the tightness in my chest just my good old chronic anxiety or oh my god, was the 5G COVID conspiracy theory true all along and now I'm the fool? Or how about this? You open up your inbox and amongst the thousands of emails that you for sure will get to this week, maybe you do have some money to spare for the prince down in his luck this time around. Okay, now before you start rolling your eyes at, at the Prince scam, isn't it just a bit shocking that phishing still costs so much to our society? From the breach of personal data to the security and integrity of our democratic processes, phishing is still a massive threat. 93% of data breaches, for example, are perpetrated through the use of phishing, and 70% of governmental breaches are associated with phishing. According to the FBI's 2019 Internet Crime Complaint Center, Losses associated with phishing scams like business email compromise, romance fraud, etc., exceeded $3.5 billion in the U.S. alone. We've also seen that phishing can be leveraged as a tool uh, against our uh, democratic elections. Yet for zero-day phishing, automated detection such as blacklist machine learning is insufficient for phishing mi mitigation, forcing the human user and potential victim to serve as the final line of defense against phishing attempts. And our society is threatened by way more than the mammoth that phishing already is. Here in the US, we've got electoral fraud claims being thrown around leading to protests, riots, and insurrection, notwithstanding the foreign interference that has happened in our elections. Vaccine hesitancy is booming amidst a pandemic that is ongoing now for nearly two years. And we have now arguably reached a point where science is akin to mere opinion, often following along political lines. I feel that I'm not completely wrong here when I venture to say that all of this and so much more has polarized us all into either unsettling apathy or fervent righteousness. Not to be a Debbie Downer, but our democracies are at stake, public health is in peril, and the words impartial and news are now colloquially antonyms. If you're picking up what I'm putting down here, the overarching theme of all of this is that the web has increasingly become an ecosystem for deception. Cyber social engineering attacks such as phishing, deceptive ads, and disinformation have put internet users and even national security and democracies at great peril. False information is greatly shaping the political, social, and economic landscapes of our society, exacerbated and brought to light by social media. All of this falls into what I call the deceptive text umbrella. From purposefully deceptive text of facts, rumors, half-truths, or outright lies disseminated manipulatively, we can see how all of these buzzwords are connected. But you might be wondering, <laughs> okay, but what's phishing doing here? Well, phishing is a social engineering attack aimed at influencing users via deceptive arguments into taking an action, such as clicking on a malicious link. Though phishing differs from disinformation, for example, in its modus operandi, we argue that it overlaps with misleading media and its main purpose, which is galvanization. All of these types of texts within the deceptive text umbrella aim to galvanize users into, say, clicking a link uh, or developing an opinion by triggering the victim's emotions. Disinformation, misinformation, phishing, they are all tools of and for deception. We know intuitively that deceptive texts are all in a state of constant change. We saw it happening during the COVID-19 pandemic and the 2020 U.S. general election, for example. But below the surface, there are likely constants within these deceptive texts. Our research posits that they all leverage influence cues. So towards this end, we looked at several types of influence cues that are relevant and present in deceptive texts. If you're not familiar with him, psychology and marketing professor Robert Cialdini proposed six principles of persuasion that identify contexts in which people are more susceptible to influence. So for example, people are more likely to comply with requests made by figures of authority. We act impulsively in the face of scarcity. We'll reciprocate or repay favors. There's sensitivity to herd mentality as a form of social proof. Uh, we tend to comply to requests made by others based on sh shared liking or similarity. And there's pressure to behave in line with prior commitments. We also looked at attribution of blame or guilt and the use of inf em uh, emphasis, such as capital letters. The subjectivity or objectivity of the sentences in the text, this is more so related to whether a sentence presented itself as an opinion or grounded by evidence. So for example, uh, this makes me so angry would be subjective while 
<laughs> according to the CDC, injecting bleach doesn't actually really help with COVID would be an example of an objective text. We also looked at the framing of the message as either potentially causing a gain or a loss. Now, few works have actually looked at these influence cues in the context of mis and disinformation, but if we look at phishing research, a large effort has already been made into investigating the extent to which Cialdini's principles of persuasion are used in phishing emails and how users are susceptible to them. And there's quite a few things we can gather from related work. Research on deception detection reveals that deceivers apply influence cues and messages to increase their appeal to the recipients. We know that these influence cues are highly occurring in deceptive texts and that users are extremely susceptible to them. We also know from our own work and related work that authority was the most frequent principle of persuasion in phishing emails followed by scarcity. The user's personality is also a big factor at play. Extroversion, for example, has been found to uh, lead to increased susceptibility to the commitment uh, liking authority influence cues. Uh, demographics is another huge factor. Young adults, for example, have been shown to be most vulnerable to the scarcity principle, while older adults are more susceptible to reciprocation, but all age groups are susceptible to authority. In terms of hyperpartisan and fake news, we can actually see some similar findings. News articles that support authority are shared and liked more often, whereas articles high in reciprocity are shared least. And psychology research has suggested that loss, that is framing an outcome as a possible loss, is more impactful than the possibility of a gain. So we know people are more driven to avoid a loss. So the question arises, influence cues, all right, cool, but what can we do with these? Well, if 2020 has taught us anything, is that human beings, just like our automated inventions, are flawed. Looking again at phishing, we know that training humans to detect phishing is difficult to navigate because users' individual characteristics like age, forgetfulness, overconfidence hinder training efficacy. We think, oh yeah, I for sure could detect phishing, yet users often experience high victimization rates in simulated phishing attacks. So what's the great magical solution that I have for you today? Well, communications research points us towards the dangers of what's called selective exposure, a theory akin to confirmation bias pertaining to the idea that we favor information that reinforces our prior beliefs. Research has also given us the understanding that false content can increase our beliefs in a falsehood, um, so misinformation is actually extremely insidious. But if we borrow from communications, journalism, psychology, and even some related work in our own field, we know that the ability to think, to think deliberatively and analytically is generally associated with the rejection of misinformation and disinformation, regardless of your political alignment. Therefore, activating, if you will, this analytical thinking and helping users slow down for just a second to think may act as an antidote to selective exposure. We've recently even seen somewhat similar examples of this at work, aiming to expose a source of information. Twitter has begun showing its users some labels indicating government or state-affiliated media accounts, presumably with the hope that this will allow users to make more informed decisions. So what if we could look beneath the surface of a text and bring awareness of the influence cues present in it? This may in turn aid users by providing additional context in the message, thus helping the user think analytically with the added bonus of benefiting future work aimed at the automatic detection of deceptive online content. So what would that look like? Well, a lot of recent works have looked at binary classification as the ultimate goal here. Is this disinformation or not? Is this phishing or not? What if for now, where we're being flooded by ambiguity and duplicitous information, we can think of an intermediary step help users slow down and make a decision by adding friction to the process of consuming information online. Similar to the calorie label on any food you pick up at your supermarket, what if whenever you were exposed to a piece of text online, you, were also, you, would, you could also know what influence cues are present in the text, and then you can make your own, hopefully, better informed decision. What if we could see, for example, that this Russian IRA Facebook ad was leveraging a wealth of influence cues? Towards this goal, we needed to first curate a relatively large data set of 3,000 diverse online pieces of text, which we broke up into what we call purposefully deceptive texts, uh, hyperpartisan news and mainstream center news. 
For the deceptive text, we randomly selected a thousand texts from a variety of data sets online. These samples encompassed uh, Facebook ads used by the Russian Internet Research Agency, made available by the U.S. House of Representatives Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence after Facebook internal audits. These texts were believed to have been exposed to 126 million Americans between 2015 and 2017. We also leveraged fake news and phishing emails randomly selected from public data sets. And we further selected 1,000 hyperpartisan news texts and another 1,000 mainstream news texts, data between 2016 and 2019. These news texts are made up of right, left, and center-leaning publishers. These ratings are based on the all-sides bias, all bias rating. Some examples of these are uh, for the right-leaning texts, uh, Breitbart and National Review, for center mainstream media, NPR and Reuters, and for left-leaning uh, media, uh, BuzzFeed News and Vox. We also extracted some features from these texts, specifically emotional salience features learned via sentiment analysis, topical structure inferred by topic modeling, and social linguistic features related to influence keywords. The social linguistic features are captured using LUC, which is a natural language processing framework that connects commonly used words with categories. Because LUC has over 70 total categories, which are not all overtly related to influence, we manually selected seven categories as features related to influence. So for the scarcity uh, principle of influence, we selected the LUC category time. For emotion, we selected anxiety, anger, and sadness. And for loss and gain framing, we chose risk, money, and reward. With our data set ready, we then proceeded with a rigorous <laughs> coding or labeling process. Uh, we drafted a detailed coding manual defining all influence cues with several examples. We conducted an initial training session with nine undergraduate students with workshop style training so that the coders could familiarize themselves with the coding platform, the code book, and the text. After this, two intercoder reliability pretests pre pre were conducted where coders were asked to independently code 20 and then 40 texts each. After these pretests, a discussion and then a new training session followed to clarify any issues with the categories in the codebook. Following these additional discussion and training sessions, coders were then instructed to co code 260 texts, which served as our intercoder reliability sample. To, co uh, to calculate the intercoder reliability, we used three indexes uh, Cohen's Kappa, uh, Percent of Agreement, and Pro and Lee's index, which all range from 0.4 to 0.99, which is considered moderately satisfactory. The remaining texts were divided equally between all the coders, and the entire coding process then lasted three months. Now, uh, let's look at a couple of examples. Here we have a known phishing email allegedly from PayPal, very joyfully <laughs> informing you that you've been charged $175 and you'll receive a mystery item in just a few days. Our coders identify the use of several influence cues, such as authority and gain framing. Uh, our automated methods also found very high positive sentiment and the use of reward, time, and money in the email. And here's that uh, Russian IRA Facebook ad again. This was one of the many used to target Americans during the 2016 general election. And this one's got everything. It's got negative sentiment, blame, anger, all of these indicating high use of emotional appeal. With this data set in mind, we developed the two level hierarchical learning based architecture that we call Lumen. Uh, on the first level, Lumen receives as input the predictive features that we extracted from the text, uh, specifically sentiment, social linguistic, and topic modeling features. On its second level, we employed a general purpose machine learning algorithm to predict the influence cues. We went with random forest uh, algorithm as it provides the level of importance for each feature without additional computational costs. Um, again, our main priority here was to discover which topics or features were most important in detecting influence cues. Uh, we then trained Lumen um, using five-fold cross-validation and compared uh, Lumen's performance across three other machine learning algorithms. Lumen was comparable to LSTM in terms of the F1 micro score, but offered better interpretability of both a data set and the decision-making process uh, that Lumen undergoes, consequently providing invaluable insights for feature selection. Uh, now, the big takeaway here is that although this is a relatively straightforward process to conduct a supervised prediction problem, machine learning is indeed promising for the retrieval of influence cues in text. We also came to some very interesting uh, findings just um, by analyzing the 3,000 manually coded text. Overall, most texts in the data set apply between three and six influence cues. Uh, we hypothesize that these findings may reflect the potential appeal or popularity of texts of moderate complexity. 
Most texts also applied authority, which is concerning because authority has been shown to be one of the most impactful principle, uh, principles of, of influence um, in user susceptibility to phishing. It's also important to note that the frequency of influence cues varied by the type of text. So, uh, for example, the principle of uh, persuasion commitment was most common in fake news articles, while scarcity was most common in phishing emails. Uh, contrary to psychology research that stipulates that people may be proactive towards avoiding a loss than gaining something, our data set indicates maybe the opposite. Uh, gain was more prevalent than loss, especially in the case of phishing emails, suggesting that attackers might be attempting to lure users to potential financial gain. We also hypothesize that phishing emails um, exhibited these high rates of framing because successful phishing survives only via a direct action from the user, such as clicking a link, which may therefore motivate you attackers to implement framing as a key driving force. In line with this, the data set invoked an overall positive sentiment with phishing emails containing the most positive average sentiment and fake news with the most negative average sentiment. And you might have noticed what's arguably our biggest overall takeaway, which is deceptive texts vary in quantifiable ways by influence cues. So uh, let's go through a few examples. Um, when comparing the Russian IRA ads, fake news, and phishing emails, um, we saw that fake news used notably more authority, objectivity, and blame and guilt. It was much lower in sentiment compared to phishing emails and the IRA Facebook ads. Similarly, uh, right-leaning hyperpartisan news had a higher frequency of commitment than left-leaning hyperpartisan news, while left-leaning news had more uh, liking, reciprocation, and scarcity than right-leaning news. Another example is that left hyperpartisan news had the highest averages for anxiety, <laughs> sadness, reward, and time. Uh, phishing evoked risk and money, while fake news evoked the most anger. This diversity across the text types gives evidence of the highly imbalanced application of influence cues in real, deceptive, or misleading campaigns. With all of this in mind now, let's uh, take a look at the big picture. Our results highlight the promise of machine learning to expose influence cues in text. The goal of detecting these cues is to improve the accuracy of human detection of cyber social engineering th threats, potentially triggering users to think analytically. To address new deceptive campaigns and improve user decision making when confronted with potentially suspicious texts, the next generation of interventions focused on mitigating deception may very well benefit from exposing influence cues to users and could complement uh, automatic detection. And with that, thank you very much to Enigma for this platform and everyone watching in home or at, uh, at home or in person ready for questions. Thank you.